Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at the Judy Mikovits London Real interview. So we see that Judy Mikovits is a scientist who has really promoted this idea of a pandemic, right? She had a video that was on YouTube, but it was banned. And I did a video about that not that long ago. Now, after that video, she goes on to London Real, which is a website that's known for a lot of conspiratorial thinking type figures. And she does this interview, it's almost two hours. Now, some of the things that she said, I'm not going to talk about in this video. They're just so far out there. But I have received a number of requests to address what's in there. So I've picked some of the points that she tried to make, and I'm going to challenge those in this video. I'm going to analyze them and refute them. Now, before I get into that, I want to address this question I've received many times about how Mikowitz has influenced so many people. I get many questions like, how is this possible? Why are people believing her? A lot of people are just shocked by this. Well, before COVID-19, most people would have just dismissed somebody like Mikowitz out of hand, right? Some of the theories she puts out there people would look at and say, there's no way I'm believing that. The difficulty is that conspiratorial thinking increases dramatically during times of increased stress, anxiety, and perceived danger. So COVID-19 has caused all of those elements. On top of this, conspiratorial thinking is facilitated by feeling alienated, isolated, unloved, rejected, or unwanted. These have occurred because of social distancing, which of course is necessary to combat COVID-19. So with conspiratorial thinking on the rise, is it a good idea to directly challenge the assertions of people like Mikovits? What about the backfire effect? Won't challenging people's beliefs simply lead to the solidification of those beliefs? Well, the backfire effect is definitely real, but it's more intense when challenging ideas that define a person's worldview or their sense of self. So if somebody's identity is wrapped up with conspiracy theories. The risk of the backfire effect is more pronounced. But arguments designed to attack the logic and reason of a conspiracy theory without challenging someone's identity can actually be remarkably successful. One of the keys here is to give people the skills and the tools to logically analyze data and apply critical thinking skills. So we want to encourage analytic thinking. For example, we might see questions like this that we might ask of a conspiracy theorist. What is the source of the evidence you're using? Is it credible? What is the strength of the evidence? Have you examined multiple sources and types of evidence? What evidence supports a counter argument? And how is the evidence logically connected to the claim? I'm going to keep all this in mind as I go through the eight key points that I've selected from this Mikovits interview with London Real. Point number one, Mikovits said in that interview that social distancing won't end a viral outbreak. She said that social distancing hurts people. It causes depression, stress, anxiety, fear, isolation. And she also said that masks are scary. Well, social distancing was never supposed to end the outbreak, as in containment. It was supposed to flatten the curve, and it has done that. It's interesting that she weighs in on the mental health factors here, essentially arguing that the benefits of social distancing, if there are any, are outweighed by mental health symptoms caused by social distancing. There's really no doubt that social distancing has come at a cost. Many people are sad, bored, frustrated, frightened, and some are even traumatized by having to stay isolated. All of those feelings are painful and will undoubtedly have some long-term mental health consequences. But we are actually weighing those consequences against death. That's important to keep in mind. The alternative is not pleasant. Ironically, one of the most obvious symptoms of social distancing has been an increase in conspiratorial thinking. Mikovits makes this point convincingly, maybe without even knowing it. Now, what about her point about masks being scary to children? Well, people do a lot of scary things, right? Children see a lot of things that are unpleasant or unusual. I think masks are probably not a significant problem again, compared to what we already see. We don't have any studies on this, of course, because there hasn't been a time 
recently where a large portion of many populations have regularly worn masks. So we don't really know for sure, but children are actually fairly resilient. I don't want to discount their resiliency and say they're vulnerable to just about everything, like they can't tolerate somebody wearing a mask. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Point number two, Mikovits says that all the data show that love and sunshine do what masks don't do. That is, they boost immunity. Well, I looked for research on this, but I couldn't find any studies comparing love and sunshine to masks. So I can't say her theory is impossible. There's nothing wrong with love and sunshine, but I think I'll stick with my mask for now. Their effectiveness has been established. They're not perfect, but they do tend to reduce the risk of coronavirus transmission. Point number three, Mikovits said that hugging won't spread the coronavirus. Well, I'm pretty sure it will. Unlike the love and sunshine argument, there are articles that suggest close contact leads to the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, right? So she's really giving dangerous advice here. Point number four, Mikovits says that herd immunity occurred in places that avoided social distancing. Well, the available evidence strongly refutes this. The word she was looking for was death. Death is what occurred in places that avoided social distancing. Point number five, we see that Mikovits doubles down on the publication about the flu vaccine and coronavirus that she mentioned in the pandemic video. So what this publication said was that individuals who had the flu vaccine were more vulnerable to get coronavirus. Now, I'm really surprised that she revisits this argument, which has already been dismantled thoroughly. As I explained in my video countering her pandemic video, she cherry-picked a statistic that wasn't even about SARS-CoV-2 and failed to mention research that disproved her claim. Point number six. We see that Mikovits says there's a lot of data that supports this conspiracy theory, the one about the vaccines. So I get the sense that the word she was looking for here was none. None of the data support her conspiracy theory. At this point in the interview, I feel like she's just prefacing so many sentences with this phrase, all the data support, right? She just puts that in front of everything, like it makes her sound correct. All the data support, and then she just says whatever she feels like. So if somebody was going to go ask for a raise at work, and they go to their boss and say, I'm pretty good at what I do. I would like a raise. How would that work compared to saying, all the data support that I should get a raise? Life doesn't work that way. That preface may sound clever, but it doesn't make what she says after the preface true. Point number seven, Mikovits said that there has been no safety testing of vaccines in 36 years. I find this one particularly interesting because, in a sense, wasn't the article that she cited about the risks of the influenza vaccine a study about safety? In fact, it was one of thousands of studies about vaccine safety, right? I don't know where she gets this from. That makes no sense at all. Point number eight, Mikovits says that this vaccine conspiracy has been going on for 40 years. She says that the conspirators have discouraged the use of natural remedies for illness, despite hundreds of thousands of years of research. This is what she says, hundreds of thousands of years. That's a long time. That's a lot of research. I didn't know there were articles dating back hundreds of thousands of years. Now, she also says that cannabis-based therapies have been suppressed by the government. I'm really not surprised by this statement. Now, this assertion about the 40-year vaccine conspiracy is actually one of the easiest to disprove. It can be disposed of using mathematics, but it does require a little bit of explanation. One of the challenges of large conspiracies that has been evident in conspiracies that were real is that people are not good at keeping secrets. The more people you enter into a conspiracy, the less time that conspiracy can stay together. Each additional conspirator introduces more risk of failure. Eventually, one of the conspirators will deliberately or inadvertently reveal the truth. This simply becomes a function of the number of conspirators across time. So there could be a very large conspiracy for a short amount of time or a small conspiracy over a longer amount of time, but you can't have a large conspiracy over an extended duration. This reality is a function of personality. Multiple expressions of specific personality traits 
leave someone vulnerable to breaking a conspiracy when they're on the inside of that conspiracy. For example, high openness to experience, low conscientiousness, like being impulsive, high extroversion, like being talkative, low agreeableness, and high neuroticism. Also, certain mental health symptoms would increase the risk, like psychosis, substance use, mania, generalized anxiety disorder, and narcissistic and borderline personality disorders. So people are supposed to believe that these conspiracies not only involve potentially thousands of people, but none of the people have personality traits or mental health symptoms as I described. Now using probabilities, it's possible to calculate the maximum time to imminent failure for any conspiracy based on how many conspirators are involved in it. Now Mikovits says that this vaccination conspiracy has been going on for 40 years, as I mentioned, yet the maximum time a conspiracy this size could last is 3.15 years. Even if I were to give Mikovits the benefit of the doubt and say that this conspiracy only lasted 30 years, the maximum number of people involved in that conspiracy for it to last that long would be 418. So way short of the tens of thousands of people that would have to be involved in that conspiracy. So essentially, the vaccine conspiracy defies the laws of probability. Now, considering it is functionally impossible, how do people justify it logically? Well, I don't see anything that Mikovits said that overcomes the mathematical argument, but I have seen some other anti-vaccination supporters connect their conspiracy over to one of my favorite conspiracy theories. They do this in order to get around the inconvenient laws of probability. The theory they link it to is this idea that the conspirators are actually alien lizard humanoids. If all the conspirators were lizards, then the calculations would need to be redone to compensate for lizard personalities. The good news is that this gives us some insight into the personalities of these lizard people based on what we know about the personality profile that would lead to a failure of a conspiracy, I can deduce the personality profile of the lizard people. Ostensibly, their profile would lead to a successful conspiracy. In order for them to succeed, they would have to be low in openness, high in conscientiousness, low in extroversion, high in agreeableness, but not altruistic, and low in neuroticism. So there we have it. If you should spot a lizard person who is rigid in their thinking, perfectionistic, shy, overly trusting, and exceedingly calm under pressure, they may be involved in a successful conspiracy. I know whenever I talk about conspiracy theories, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.